Good morning. Um, thank you for joining me. Um, I'm Andy. I've been a web performance consultant as a full-time job for over 10 years. Um, and I've spent a lot of time helping people with third-party tags. And third-party tags, we have a love-hate relationship with them. As web performance people, we often think, this site would be fast if only it didn't have these third-party tags on it. And what I'd like to do today is challenge that uh, assumption and talk a bit about how we can begin to learn to love third-party tags. But first, we have to talk about the challenges that tags bring. They compete for our network. Uh, this is from the network view of web page test, which shows you what's going on on the connections. Um, this is CNN.com, which if you've ever run CNN.com through web page test, you will know it's terrible. Um, but you can see here, we can see how busy each of the network connections is by the, the dark section of the um, line. And we can see here where the main one has this section where there's no activity, because what's happening is these two connections, are two third parties, are taking and consuming the network. Um, they make us wait for new connections. When we connect or request a script from a third party, we have to make a new connection. And we can see that as we get more, it takes longer and longer to make the connection. And then lastly, they compete for our main thread. Third party script uh, tags are predominantly JavaScript. And they sit and fight with our scripts for the main thread. They delay things being rendered. And this is a, a screenshot from Chrome DevTools um, from an actual customer I worked with. And by the time we'd finished, the main thread looked slightly different. Um, and I'd like you to sort of remember this one. We'll come back to this one later so I can show you what I actually did. But as much as third-party tags are a challenge and they can create performance problems, they also provide important features. You know, they provide us with things like analytics so we can monetize our site. Sorry, advertising so we can monetize our site. In some cases, they provide user-generated content, so shopping sites where people send images of them wearing the clothes, for example. Um, we do reviews, things like Hotjar for session replay. So we, they provide lots and lots of important features, and we still need them. But so the question I like to ask, and the I question I like to ask my customers and encourage my customers to think about is how do we find that balance? How do we find the balance between the challenges that third party tags bring and the benefits they give to us? And the first place I always start is with Simon Hearn's request map and looking at what's actually on the page. Where does it come from? This is a UK retailer. Um, and in this case, this sort of circle at the center of the galaxy, if you like, is the content from the site. The purple blob at uh, one o'clock is um, Qubit's smart serve. And then the others are marketing pixels, GTM, um, other tags that get loaded. But it's good to see what's on the site. And then I asked some key questions. Um, does anybody, is anybody still paying for it? Do we still use this third party tag? And it's got better with GDPR, where as site owners, we become responsible for where our visitors' data goes and how it's treated. People have got much better at understanding what's on the site, 
and is it being used? Because they have to know where the data is going. Um, are there any duplicates? It's still not unusual to find um, Adobe Analytics and Google Analytics on the same site because the analytics team likes Adobe, but the ads team uh, needs Google. Um, for static content, for things coming from unpackage.com or Google Fonts and other places, can we replace it with a locally hosted um, version? Then I often do some work about how does the tag ex affect the visitor's experience? Does it matter? Is it having a significant uh, impact? And then we get into questions which I'll focus more on today is when should we load it and where should it be executed? Because it doesn't just have to be on the main thread. And some of those questions are easy. If you're a retailer or um, a financial site, some of those questions are easy to answer. If you're in the world of the news, then it gets much more difficult because news sites have a hard time. They've got to a situation where social networks have stolen their traffic because in the world of the news, people see a news story on Facebook or whatever social network people are using, click on it, read it, leave. Um, so. Social networks have stolen their traffic, and advertisers have stolen their revenue. Um, when you look at the studies of what we, as advertisers, pay for banners and ads on a web page, and then you look at how much money the site actually ends up with, the whole ad tech ESQ system takes a huge bite of that cake. Um, so. It's hard for newspapers. But what I'd like to think about is we often talk about page load as a journey. So the point where we click on a link, or we type a URL in, we watch the page load, and it builds up, similar here to how OPI, the nail varnish site, um, loads. And I like to think of page load as a journey then where do our third parties fit into that journey? Um, and the things to think about here is that tags that are loaded early in the page often have the largest impact on the user experience because they come first. They often come before critical content. Um, they often get put in the head of the page. So they become render blocking or HTML parser blocking. Um, and typical things here are tag managers, experimentation, because we want our experiments to run before the rest of the page loaded. Personalization. So if you've got tags that are outside this in being loaded early in your page, I would ask the question, why? So where you can avoid render blocking third parties and avoid them not just because they're render blocking, but the browser will stop being able to do work until it's made the connection. Um, and making that connection can add a significant delay. And we often focus in um, web performance on what happens when loading that third party fails. And we produce videos like this, and this is a test page I built. Um, it's got Google fonts on it, and in the version on the left, no, right even, sorry, um, Google fonts isn't loading. And this will go on for 30 seconds until the page loads, um, until we see something, and we don't have that long to wait. So we often focus on them failing. But I think it's worth thinking about what happens when they succeed. And this is the same page with the fonts hosted locally and the fonts hosted on Google Fonts. And we can see that where the fonts are hosted locally, it's a tenth of a second faster. And Google Fonts is fast. So you know, we've just made a 20% improvement. 
to when content first appears by moving um, the fonts onto our domain. We often think about, should we use um, HTML pre-connect to speed it up? And in this case, and in many cases, HTML pre-connect won't save us. If, it's, if it's, our HTML is fast to download, we cannot make the pre-connect fast enough before the browser discovers it needs to make this connection. And in this example, there's, something, there's also something called HTTP early hints, where um, the server can send a HTTP 103 response, and that can contain a pre-connect pre directive, but that relies on there being a delay while it takes the server to build the page to work. So pre-connect and uh, early hints won't save us in this example. They may save us in some other examples. But we might not be able to use pre-connect to a third party anyway. Because making a pre-connect discloses the visitor's IP address to that third party. IP address in Europe under GDPR is personal data. Before you give personal data to a third party, you have to ask for the visitor's consent, um, unless it's legitimate usage. But unfortunately, a lower German court decided that using Google fonts wasn't legitimate usage. There was an alternative. They could locally host the fonts. So lower German court can't use Google Fonts. Um, it will undoubtedly be retried in a higher court, but um, the way Google are losing privacy cases across Europe, it wouldn't surprise me um, if you know, they continue to lose. And the reality is if Google Fonts isn't legitimate usage, then static content from other third-party hosts, whether it's Google Fonts, whether it's Typekit, um, whether it's from places like Unpackage or JS Deliver, they're not legitimate uses either. And that's OK. I think that's a good thing. Um, I strongly believe that performance reasons, for performance reasons, we should self-host our static assets. And um, Harry Roberts wrote this excellent blog post on why you should do that. Um, word of warning, I may have spent the month of October last year, writing our technical and organizational measures for GDPR and writing our data transfer impact assessment and doing all the research for it. But I'm not a lawyer nor a data protection officer. So you should talk to yours. And from talking to them, they will love you if you come to them with these questions. So we need consent before we can load third party tags. And all consent managers aren't created equal. Some are faster than others. Um, and we often only think about consent when we see the dialog box put in front of people asking us for consent. But the reality is it has to fire on every page. Um, we may only see the box once and ask for it and say yes we agree, or no, we don't. But on every page after that, once we've made our decision, it's still loaded. And we still have to wait for the consent manager to load before the third parties can load. And so some are faster than others. Uh, Quantcast, which is allegedly the most popular CMP in the world, um, is particularly slow. Um, and Cookie Law, which I think is opting on, um, is much faster. Um, so, you know, picking a CMP can, which CMP you pick matters. Um, I actually think that CMPs are an ideal thing to move to edge compute, to move to Cloudflare Workers or Fastly's Edge or Akamizer Edge, because they already know things about the visitor. They know where the visitor is based. So. They can decide whether this person needs to be asked for consent or not. They can do things like, once the visitor's given consent, they can inject pre-connects. Um, they can do more work at the edge. And funnily enough, Fastly bought a company called, sorry, Cloudflare bought a company called Zaraz 
uh, a few years ago. And the last month, they actually launched a consent manager that works at the edge. Um, the other thing I often think about is whether consent management be built into browsers. Um, so that it's in the browser. And I have mixed feelings about this because you know, we have to trust browsers. Um, they see everything we do. And even though they see everything we do, they may not always operate um, in our interests. And I would argue Chrome's Topics API, where advertisers can see the stuff we're interested in, is not acting on our, in our interest. Um, consent brings other challenges, too. Um, quite a few sites use polyfill.io to um, polyfill for old browsers, for APIs that exist in new browsers and don't exist in older browsers. And there's a bit of a challenge here. You could argue that this is, this is legitimate consent. Um, but again, some things we can do to help with that is we could proxy polyfill.io using our CDN. Um, and Andrew Betts of Fastly wrote an article um, that talks about how they do that for some um, third parties on Fastly.com. I think they talk about how they do it for Google Analytics, um, for example. Um, but if you choose this approach, and by proxying them, they come onto your domain, so they act as if they're being loaded from your domain. One of the things you have to watch is the cookies that are on your domain, your session cookies, your authorization cookies, are then exposed to that third party. So they need filtering um, at the CDN. Um, CDN may also do things like have X forwarded for with an IP address in it, and they also need um, filtering out to ensure your visitor's privacy remains. Um, but even in this case, there are still really difficult choices to make, such as when we get to A-B testing, we're faced with two choices. We have um, the original optimizely model where we put a blocking script in the head, and until that script was loaded and parsed, the rest of the page couldn't load. So the browser's blocked, and we're waiting for the page. Then the other alternative is the Google Optimize, the Adobe Target view of the world, where they have a script that hides the page until the A-B testing um, has finished work and then shows it. And which of those is better? Um, at a conference, we came to the conclusion that anti-flicker snippet was better because the browser could still load the page underneath, but they're horrible decisions. Um, and you know, how does it fit into the consent? How can you do A-B testing until you have the consent of the visitor? It's hard. Um, Fastly got around, not Fastly, Casper got around this by actually self-hosting the Optimizely script. Uh, Optimizely have the option that you can use it with edge workers now, which, which helps. Um, but some of these decisions around the start of page load are really, um, really hard. Um, other tags can wait until the page is complete. I often think, you know, why load Hotjar? Why load your chat widget until the visitor has the experience in front of them? Um, so we can delay those. One of the things to watch out is when we delay those, I typically delay them to on load, is it means they load later. Um, and one of the things to watch out for is Load won't fire until your slowest asset has loaded. So if you have something that suddenly takes a long time, then your chat widget may take a long time to appear. Um, there are some ways to work around um, the fact that it means things happen later. So I often help people, and we use GTM to inject a pre-connect, a, pre a DOM content loaded. So we get the connection phase out of the way. And then the script fetch and the load of the, the chat widget, for example, can still happen sooner. And it frees up the network. It frees up the main thread to load our more important content. Um, and tag managers, GTM 
Um, Adobe's tag manager, this name forgets me, are really helpful for doing this. So, you know, we can, most people have tags that are loaded on page view, so they get loaded as soon as the page loads. Um, but we can choose to delay them to DOM ready or window loaded. So we can push back when they happen. Um, some tags can be loaded on interaction. And I don't think this happens enough, and I don't think it happens enough by default. Um, Calibre, uh, a web performance monitoring company from Australia, uh, wrote a widget for Intercom, I think it is, so that when Intercom loads on their site, essentially all you get is a little image that loads. And until somebody goes to interact with the icon, the rest of Intercom doesn't load. Um, Paul Irish, Chrome fame, um, wrote a lazy loader for YouTube. It has some issues on mobile, um, but if you ever looked at the YouTube embedded widget, it's huge. And it's not needed until um, somebody actually chooses to start to play the video. Um, you can also do things like load recapture uh, lazily. And this um, article shows how to load it on interaction with the form. Um, the challenge is, is Google don't recommend that, but unfortunately they never really tell you why they don't recommend that. So there are some things to think about in, in some of these. Um, one of the things I often find with recapture, for example, is it gets loaded on every page on a website rather than the pages it uses. So in those situations, I get people to load it using GTM only load it for the URLs that it really needs to be on. I talked a bit about what we can push to the end. I've talked a bit about how we speed up um, the bits at the beginning. And I haven't really talked about what I call um, the messy middle. And the sort of questions we have to ask here is, is what is the tag doing? Is it providing content that matters to the visitor? Um, some retailers have a load of PayPal um, tag that puts a nice little PayPal icon below the price um, and a way of paying via PayPal. And that often gets loaded in the head. And what I encourage people to do is actually move it to where it is in the page so it's at the right place. So it doesn't get loaded early. It's not blocking the initial render of the page, but it will block um, later on. Um, the later we load things like analytics, the more data we will use, lose, because people will leave or move on to the next page before the analytics um, script fires. So push them back, better user experience, lose a bit of data. Pull them forward, slightly worse user experience, uh, keep a bit more data. So there are questions and challenges we have to think about here. but. Things like server ta side tagging, which has been around for a long time, um, but has only become a bit more popular with GTM, can help in this situation. Um, and as an example of how this process works for an actual live site, I've got an example where I worked with a UK newspaper, um, one of the large UK, UK, large UK newspapers back in uh, 2021. And what we did is we started to classify the tags by how important they are and how urgent they are. Um, and then we then chose to load them based on that. And we split them into um, strategic buckets. So the core content, consent management, primary partners, secondary partners, secondary content, and leftovers. And this is how they lined up. Um, they used AMP as a framework rather than um, for the AMP cache stuff, so that had to load first, their player for videos. Um, then uh, we loaded Quantcast for consent, uh, some primary partners, which brought, brought them mostly advertising revenue, some secondary partners, some stuff like visitor comments, um, and then some leftovers. And we help them improve. Um, then we should think about, you know, 
where should the tag be executed? At the moment, the choice has been just on the main thread. Um, but there are some interesting alternatives. Um, GTM server-side tagging helps from a privacy point of view because the container is being loaded on your uh, infrastructure, so there are no requests going to third parties. Um, and it sends one beacon that can then be fanned out um, to other options. So it, it's better from a privacy point of view. And I know customers who've moved to this for privacy reasons. Um, we could start executing on the edge. There are a few people starting to do this. I know somebody who does A-B testing on the edge, somebody else who built consent on the edge. Um, so they're starting to think about this. Alex Joes of Google put together a proposal to formalize A-B testing on the edge. Um, and it's got interesting possibilities. Um, we can also execute tags in workers too. Um, and Party Town sort of brought this to life, most of all, the idea to life. And the thing I really hope for with Party Town is that what they've proven from uh, executing tags in workers and the performance benefits it can bring actually get incorporated into the tags themselves. Because uh, implementing Party Town is not simple. It's not a drop-in replacement. Um, if you look at all the examples, they're really simple websites. I know of three or four people who are prototyping it on anything from telco websites to um, retail websites. And I've done some prototyping, and it requires um, work. So. We still have things to learn here. Um, so we've currently got this idea that we can begin to think about where should we execute our tag, from the main thread to a worker to the edge to server side, and then when should we load it? And I wrote this a while back, and I am still thinking about how to find uh, the balance here. But the big thing is start measuring third-party performance. Um, this is a chart from Speakerv, who I work for. Um, other products do similar things. But we can see from our synthetic tests, um, and this is for Halfords, um, who you know, is, is causing us problems, from Google Tag Manager to Content Square to Qubit to Hotjar. Um, we can begin to track who's causing us problems and you know, start to talk about what we do with it. Um, measure with and without consent, because you know, there's a big difference. Um, Halfords in the middle has 55 third-party requests without consent, because it uses Typekit and its images come from a third-party service. Um, it uses 128 uh, th third-party requests. When consent is given, uh, but when we test with just the stuff we need, we actually find there's only 11 third-party requests. So test with and without. Um, track when GTM containers get released. Um, you know, from a perspective, GTM is content we don't control. It's uh, somebody goes and updates it, container gets put on our site, might have a new tag. Uh, the first thing we find out is when our tests start to get slowed down. Um, it can send emails when containers get released, but you know it's not great. Um, I would love it to create webhooks, and thanks to GitHub Actions, we can create um, webhooks. Um, so I wrote a GitHub script that basically checks out the repo, fetches a GTM container, reformats it, extracts the version number, check if it's changed, um, calls the speed curve API in this case, but call it, could call any API, and it's available there um, if you want it. The other thing to think about is, you know, what are we doing when we're measuring? Are we measuring quantities? Are we measuring how big third-party scripts are? Are we measuring how many requests they make? Or are we measuring how long they take, what impact they have on our visitors' experience. And 
There are some snippets, sort of, you can measure how long an anti flicker snippet hides the page for, uh, how long does it take for your consent manager to become active, uh, when did a GPT, Google Publisher tag, uh, add creative load? That's when it loads. It, there's no current way to tell you when it was actually shown to the visitor, but it starts to give you some ideas. And we can, um, there's some snippets here that I've created and some other people have created to start to measure these things. But there are still gaps. Um, measuring long tasks in the wild through RUM is, is still hard. Um, but there, and getting third parties to implement, instrument their scripts is really, really hard. So there are some gaps. There are things like long animation frames that's currently in Chrome Canary if you turn on experimental platform features. Um, and uh, it's interesting because it starts to give you attribution. So you can start to understand which of your scripts, which of your third party tags are causing you some challenges. But in the last five minutes I've got, I'm going to skip some slides because I don't have quite enough time. Um, I'm going to return to our third party puzzle. Um, and I'm going to return to this customer who I was brought in just to sort out their third parties. Um, they'd rebuilt a site in Next.js and it was slower. So you can see um, these long tasks here are all related to Next.js. Um, and another team were dealing with that. Um, these tasks on the right are all their third party long tasks. And I was brought in because the development team said, oh, it's the third party tags that make the new site um, slow. And in about three weeks' work, we changed um, from the top to the bottom. And my engagement was finished, and they were left to sort out the next JS stuff. So the first thing to do is, is profile the site. Um, look at what's uh, occupying the time, what's using the time. Use Chrome DevTools. Go to John Pierre's session or buy Harry Roberts' course on using DevTools to understand how to use um, the performance um, tab in Chrome. Um, read the source. In GTM's case, it's um, there's a JSON object up the top that contains all the rules and um, some scripts underneath. And we begin to find weird things like this, um, where GTM is testing, in this case, uh, is testing for a weird IE6 bug. Um, that when, with the help of the Chrome team, I dug into it, we found relates to crux.postscribe, which is uh, as asynchronously writes JavaScript even with document right into the page. Um, we then discovered how this happens and when GTM uses document right. And it's only needed, you only need to check the box to say support document right if document right is used in that box. Um, so we searched through GTM, found all the cases, I'm just going to really quickly through here, that used it checked whether they actually used document.write and got the customer to change um, the flags. And what we discovered is GTM got smaller um, and it got faster. And uh, Rocky Nibwani, who at the time worked for George Clothing in the UK, was following this conversation on Twitter. And he did the same for George Clothing, who are part of Walmart. And what, we, what he found, and this is his live data, is that doing the same thing reduced all his long tasks and made GTM smaller. So that was part of our puzzle. We also looked at what other secrets GTM might hold. Um, I added log points for DOM operations where it's doing insert before. So we can see what's actually being um, inserted in the page. And what we found is that Google Optimize was inserting a separate copy of GA. That's going to go away because uh, Google Optimize is going away. Um, we discovered there were things inserting just new lines, just um, carriage returns, which is 
what the bottom of this video will show uh, shortly, hopefully. Yeah, so in this example here, this tag ran and inserted a new line. We never quite worked out um, what it was doing. Uh, so we found a bunch of cleanups. We think there was still more possible. But overall, at the end of the day, we made a significant difference. So the things to think about when you think about 30 party tags is they have a crucial impact on your visitor's experience. Make friends with the team that manages your tags. They want value from the tags, but they also want a good right site. They want a site to work. Remove the tags that aren't needed and don't accept the defaults. Load the tags at the best time to load the tag rather than when the vendor says you. I think about doing it server side or doing it in a worker. I chase third parties to fix their issues. Um, Third parties have lots of issues. Some people fix them. So during the work I was doing, we found a bug in Content Square. Content Square fixed it in 10 days. Um, others, four years ago, I found some bug in somebody's product, and they're still waiting for it to be fixed. Other people have shared what they've learned. Barry, who's talking later, worked for a healthcare company in Ireland, and they had a really locked down version of GTM because Healthcare data is really, really precious. Um, Gareth at the Telegraph shared about how they changed things at the Telegraph. Um, back before web-based test, excuse me, had experiments, um, I started using Cloudflare workers to run my own experiments. And this is OPI. Um, they have a slow time to first byte which um, means the page starts running slowly, but just by rearranging the tags on the page, we can make it start to show content a second sooner. So we get the benefits of the tag, but we remove their impact on the experience. And fixing the impact on the experience can have really, really positive effects. Uh, this is from 2017, from some work I did with a UK retailer. And they used Bizarre Voice. Um, and our Android Bizarre Voice was really slow. And they made the brave decision to disable it on Android. And page load time, because that's what we had then, got four seconds faster. Um, revenue from Android visitors went up 26% as a result of that change. That was about five million pounds a year. So. Third-party tags can really, really cost you. Do the work. Make them load better. Thank you. OK, thank you, Andy, for this brilliant and uh, very exciting presentation about um, the impacts on uh, third parties on web performance. Right now, we would like to know if the audience has questions. Messieurs, dames, avez-vous des questions à poser à Andy Il faut toujours un premier ou une première. Hey, um, so English or French? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, Party Town. Yep. Have you seen any real user measurements or metrics of the benefits versus cost to the third party uh, like functionality? Not yet. Um, so one of the UK's large mobile phone companies is currently prototyping it um, to see whether it's possible to put it into production. Um, I know of at least two retailers who are doing the same thing, but they are all really cautious um, because all of a sudden you've got to change the tags in the page. It's not a drop-in replacement. So you're changing away from what the third parties recommend, um, which makes people nervous. And for some lightweight tags, it may actually, the work of m doing the communication between the worker and the main thread of the browser is probably higher than the work that the third party is doing anyway. Um, so it's, it's the thing that everybody loves the idea, but it's still yet to be proven in my view. And I, what I've done with the people I know who are doing it is, is ask them 
pleaded with them um, that whatever they do, if they decide to implement it, write about it. If they decide not to implement it, write about it too. Because I think it's something we're all intrigued by, but until somebody starts to use it for real, I don't think we know the answers. Awesome, thank you. I think I'd summarize Party Town as the thing everybody's singly most excited about, but nobody knows whether there's a there there. <clears throat> Une autre question? If you have questions afterwards, I'm around for the rest of the day. So just come and find me in my flowery shirt. With, with all the stuff around the legal issues with Google Fonts and that kind of stuff, what mm -hmm. would you recommend? Would you recommend stop using third parties until that's finished? Or like, do it now, ask for permission later, <laughs> change if, if things actually go down? Um, I would, so from a legal, strict legal compliance point of view, you should not load a third party and without consent, unless you have a legitimate interest for doing it. So a consent manager gets classed as um, legitimate interest. Uh, I don't think Google Fonts is a legitimate interest, because you can self-host them. But it, it has knock-on repercussions that haven't played through yet. Um, Noya, I can't think of his name, Max, somebody, is undoubtedly going to go after Google and a few others in a few more courts around Europe. On a tout juste le temps pour une dernière question et après ce sera fini. You mentioned, sorry, you mentioned uh, Chrome Dev Tools as mm -hmm. uh, your preferred tool to uh, investigate on uh, third parties' uh, impact on performance. Yep. Do you have um, some tools to recommend to follow up the performance uh, in the time? Uh, I mean, I'm looking for a tool that could uh, uh, make this uh, automatic mm -hmm. uh, to follow up uh, how my, uh, my impact on performance evolves with time, and uh, if possible, to, to get alerts when uh, sometimes become more impacting than others? Cool. So I would actually recommend Speed Curve, but that's because I who I work with. Um, as well as Speed Curve, there are tools like uh, Debug Bear, Calibre, um, Content Square, um, and tools like that that can monitor your page on a regular basis and send you alerts when things change. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Cool. Thank you.